Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, everybody. Uh, I was expecting crickets this morning. I thought third day of a conference at 8 a.m. So there's a few stalwart souls and, and a bird, apparently. So, so that's an exciting audience for me at this, uh, at this moment. Um, I, I'm just going to jump right into things, I think, and, uh, and, and move us on to my first slide which is the disclosure slide. So Errol Food Institute, which is a funding of the Errol Family Foundation, Canada Research Chair, which comes from the Canadian government. I also have a couple of boards that I, I sit on, uh, Weston Seating Food Innovation and the Maple Leaf Centre for Action on Food Security. And I've had a number of funding sources that are listed here from the last five years. Um, in terms of the launching pad for this talk, you know, as we all know, probably the world's population is growing from its current rate of 7 billion to something in between 9 and 11 billion by mid-century. Um, and this, this, this sort of population growth issue means that uh, devising the ways to equitably, sustainably, nutritiously feed the world's growing population is one of those grand challenges that I think the history books will, will ultimately focus on when they write the history of the 21st century. Um, compounding this issue is the fact that, that, that economists and, and, and academics working in the area figure that, that the farmers of the planet are going to have to probably produce, increase production by something like 50 to 70, maybe 80 percent more over the next generation. And, uh, and the economist wrote a, an article on this a couple of years ago and uh, tried to put this into context. And this is, this is how they put it. In the next 40 years, humans will need to produce more food than they did in the previous 10,000 years put together. So facing this gargantuan task, or, or making this gargantuan task even more challenging, of course, is, is climate change, as, as we heard a long session about yesterday that was really interesting. Not only are we worried about things like, uh, like droughts happening or affecting our bread baskets, but we're also worried about the melting glaciers. About a billion people on the planet rely on glacial water melting off of them uh, in order to fuel their agricultural systems. And in the short term, warming conditions probably mean that, that the melting glaciers will, will increase flooding and, and the speed and, and, and velocity of, of runoff. But in the longer term, it probably means greater water scarcity for people who depend on this source of water. Um, and, and many people actually think we're at, at the beginning of a massive crisis in terms of this global food system. So this is the screen cover, or this, a screen capture from the cover of the 2017 uh, UN State of the Food Security and Nutrition in the World. It came out oh, two months ago, if memory serves. And uh, it, it, it was a very sobering read for me because it indicated that for the last two years, hunger, both in absolute terms and in proportional terms as a percentage of the world's population has increased. Now, throughout my career since the early 90s, almost without exception, hunger and malnutrition have declined both in absolute and proportional numbers. But for the last two years, they've been going up. And when we drill into the, um, the issue of hunger and malnutrition, we can find some fairly, some fairly alarming data. And I realize it's a, little, it's a little bit early in the day to start showing alarming data, so uh, my apologies for that. But, but I wanted to show you some United Nations food price data. This is a, an index that United Nations calculates that gives us a snapshot in time of how much food costs. Uh, data goes back to the early 1990s, and um, when we see the data unfold, we see the flat stable prices of the period from the 19, early 1990s to the 2000s giving way to one heck of a roller coaster. Prices soaring, crashing, soaring, crashing. Um, we probably are in a period of history where high volatile food prices are the norm. Now, let's just pause for a second. Before we race too far ahead with this narrative, um, the way I've just told the food security story over the last three or four minutes suggests that this is a production problem and that we're running out of food. Uh, and that the solution to this problem is to increase production, as per the economist or, or, or the academics that I was referring to earlier. But, but if it only were that simple, uh, let's instead of concluding that we need to produce more food, let's ask that as a question and then see if we can answer that question. If we produce more food, if we produce more food, will anybody go to bed at night better fed? Will nutrition improve? Will food security or food insecurity decline? Will the price of food come down? And when we ask it as a question, we can collect data. So what I'm going to do now is, over top of the food price line, I'm going to superimpose some data on supply. Now we've also got United Nations data collected at the global level on food supply, this time in dietary calories available per person per day on the planet. And when we look at this data unfold, we see that, first of all, 
1990, there were 2,600 calories per person per day. This has trended steadily upwards. And in 2013, which is the last year for which I was able to get data, there was over 2,800 calories per person per day. So there's three things that I think are worth noting on, on, on this graph. The first is the slope of the supply line. It's, it's increasing, and that's in, in per capita. That's, that's uh, for considering population growth. And this is a no monumental technological accomplishment that the world farmers have done. They've adopted technologies that have boosted production. Some of these technologies come at a social and environmental cost, which I'm, I'm happy to discuss. Uh, but, but we have to acknowledge the enormous uh, accomplishment. Uh, there's more food today per person than at any other point in human history. Secondly, there's no obvious relationship between supply of food and price of food measured at the global level. Price goes up, price comes down, price goes way up, price comes way down. Supply advances steadily. And the third thing that's worth um, noting is, is that at 2,850 calories per person per day, this sounds more like a distribution issue than it sounds like a production issue. And to put more of a visual spin on this, oh, I'm jumping ahead in my head. Uh, and then we have to acknowledge that, um, uh, that there's other things that are driving the world's food system that actually have nothing to do with supply and demand and food itself. And so what I've done here is I've superimposed over our food price line the price of oil in US dollars per barrel over this time period. And here we see a very good fit, at least since 2008, where I think we have to conclude that there's a lot of other things going on in the food system that actually have nothing to do with supply and demand. Now, in order to, uh, to make this a little more accessible on an on a early Tuesday morning after the conference fatigue is setting in, let me just sort of put a visual spin on this by introducing you to a couple of photographs from a photo essay called The Hungry Planet by Peter Menzel and Faith Deluzio. Now, these two journalists traveled around the world a few years ago taking formal family portraits where they posed each family with one week's worth of groceries. And in this way, they introduced us to the, Natomo, uh, the, um, the Revis family from, from North Carolina, Apparently, this family spends about $85 per person per week on food. And, uh, you know, it's worth sort of pausing and just sort of admiring the, the sheer color of the American diet. And it invites the obvious comparison with the Natomo family from Mali, uh, less than $2 per person per week on food, and a dramatically different uh, food supply. Hidden in these pictures, or maybe not hidden in these pictures, evident in these pictures is the question that I'd like to depart on for the main part of my talk, which is the intersection between sustainability and health in this crazy global food system. And, and, and we have to ask the question, as, long, as well as asking these questions about supply and climate change, are we actually producing the right kinds of food uh, for health and nutrition? And I've got a few slides where I'm going to try to drill into this one. But first of all, I'm going to show you on the left-hand side a slide that I've been working on with a couple of students. Um, and, and it shows what we should be eating based on nutritional recommendations. And I'm sort of being inspired by the Harvard Health Eating Plate model. We've taken a few liberties, which I'm happy to explain in the Q&A. But on the left-hand side is a rough approximation of what the Hearth, he Harvard Health Eating Plate model suggest we eat. And on the right hand side, I'm going to contrast that with United Nations statistics on what we're producing. And we start with the fruits and vegetables. We all know we should be eating more of it. Uh, half of our diet, somewhere between seven and ten servings a day, depending on age and stage and whatnot. Well, there's actually only three servings of fruit and vegetable per person per day on the planet. So we're chronically underproducing fruits and vegetables. By contrast, those cereals and starches that are, should be maybe around a fifth of our diet are being extremely overproduced about half of our food, and that's cereals and starches for human consumption only. That is not um, bioethanol or livestock feed. Oils and fats we're overproducing. Uh, protein supplies we're, um, uh, we're, we're actually underproducing a bit. Dairy depends on the nutritional guidelines you go for, but probably we're more or less accurate in terms of dairy. And the real kicker is those sugars that we should be limiting represent a significant portion of the global's food supply. Now, displayed in this way uh, as a pie graph, you can sort of see that there's a significant mismatch between what we produce and what we should be eating. I'm just going to produce the same data with slightly different categories using a bar graph so you can, you can see the, um, uh, uh, the, the actual dietary servings. So this is the re recommended serving intake um, using a combination of USDA and Harvard Health Eating Plate Model um, regulations. And there we see the grains that are being overproduced by about seven servings a day, the fruits and vegetables underproduced by, by almost two thirds, oils and fats, proteins a bit underproduced, dairy equal, 
and, and sugar, which we're not really supposed to eat, being extremely overproduced. Now, this has obviously huge health implications. We have this major obesity and type 2 diabetes uh, epidemic, but it also has significant sustainability implications. So the next step we did in this piece of research is to imagine if we ate what we were supposed to eat and the farmers then responded by producing what we were supposed to eat, uh, we would have a very significant difference in terms of land. And we see the various food categories and how their land use would change. So the ones on the bottom, milk, grains, oils and fats and sugars, we would all save significant amounts of land, uh, but we would have to then put much of that land back into fruits and vegetables, proteins. So the middle two categories, sort of the, the second and third category at the, from the top are the, the, um, the arable land implications, and then the final category up at the top is the pasture land. And when we added all this up, if we only considered arable land, we calculated that switching to a Harvard healthy eating plate model would actually save the world 51 million hectares of land agriculturally. However, and this is a bit of a kicker, much of the world's protein actually comes from pasture land. And there's a huge amount of pasture land. About two thirds of the world's farmland is actually pasture land. So if we keep producing the same amounts of meat and dairy on pasture land, in total, switching to the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate model would require about 450 million extra hectares of land, all of which would be pasture. So this suggests that we would need to figure out a much different way of handling pasture land and producing protein for ourselves. So when we tried to look into the future implications of this, we started with a business as usual scenario. This is the BAU scenario, where we start currently at 4,000, uh, uh, 4,500 million hectares. That's what we use for agriculture today. Well, it would grow. Assuming everything else is held constant, uh, except for population growth, the amount of land we will use in the future will grow. The Harvard Health Eating Plate Model diet would actually require some increases entirely due to the increased protein production on pasture land. And if we imagine switching to that so-called vegetarian plant-based diet for our protein, then the total land requirements would actually hypothetically go down. Now, this is assuming no technology change. This is holding everything constant except for population growth. But what it suggests to us is that we could actually conceivably feed the world's population through dietary change and, um, and, and, and deal with population growth that way. I have to have as disclosure though, I'm not a vegetarian, and I'll come back to this point in a few minutes. I love steak, I love ice cream, I have enjoyed a lot of tasty red meat in the last 48 hours that I've, I've, I've been in Barbados. So we have a, a very tough issue that we have to solve here. We did the same calculation, however, for greenhouse gases, uh, and we have this similar patterns. We are going to uh, increase the greenhouse gas emissions with some categories of food. We will decrease the greenhouse gas emissions with other categories of food. And again, we see the, the role of, of livestock in driving the system. So if we, um, if we consider the current situation based on our current diets, uh, using a life cycle assessment tool called Sigma Pro, we produce about six gigatons of, of, of carbon dioxide equivalents out of our major food categories every year. Well, that purple category at the bottom is what's devoted to animal agriculture. When we imagine switching to the um, Harvard Health Eating Plate model, that grows, but again, almost all of that growth is due to increases in protein. And then if we imagine the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate model for a population of 9.5 billion people, we see our greenhouse gas emissions growing again. And finally, again, most of this comes from animal agriculture. When we project into the future, just the same data displayed slightly differently, we see increases due to population growth uh, in our business as usual scenario. Our Harvard Healthy Eating Plate model sees increases, and we see significant decreases with a plant-based protein system. So the key results from this analysis is that switching to a healthier diet will reduce the amount of arable land we need. But unless we also increase the amount of plant-based protein, this transition will also result in more total land used and more greenhouse gas emissions. However, if we switch to this healthier diet and reduce the proportion of meat in our diet, we can save land, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and be healthier. So let me then pause and, and, and take the last few minutes of my talk to to discuss this, this wicked issue of what to do about animal agriculture. And I have to say here that, um, uh, or reinforce here, that, that I, I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, I believe fundamentally that animal agriculture plays a vital role in a sustainable agroecosystem. Animals cycle nutrients, they add biodiversity. Uh, they're 
vitally important culturally for, 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 for cultures all over the world. And uh, approximately one billion small-scale farmers in the planet depend on animal agriculture as a livelihood. So I'm not in any way advocating a cessation of animal-based agriculture. I also, however, acknowledge the fact that, uh, that many of the ways we currently do animal-based agriculture are unsustainable and that I, I cannot see a scenario in my mind where we move into the future dealing with problems like population growth and, and, and climate change and be able to do animal agriculture in a way that is similar to today. I think this represents a huge challenge. Uh, and so with the last part of my talk, I'd like to discuss some of these transitions or some of the innovation that's happening in the industry. And uh, here's a, a screen capture from an advertisement for a company called Sweet Earth. I, I'm in no way endorsing Sweet Earth. I've never tasted Sweet Earth's products. I've never even seen them on the grocery market shelves. I believe this is an American company. It makes a product called Benevolent Bacon, which apparently contains no bacon. And the reason I've put this Sweet Earth slide up here is because it was purchased, this company was purchased last year by Nestle. And it represents only the latest of a series of very high profile alternative protein companies which have been acquired uh, by major food manufacturers and food producers. Um, and the reason for this is that, uh, that the broad category of alternative protein is, offers a whole lot of different benefits. Now, when I say alternative protein, most people immediately think salmon, and salmon indeed, or tilapia, are, are good alternative proteins. But in addition to that are the plant-based proteins that we've talked about a bit in the last 48 hours, leg legumes in particular. Uh, here's a, 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 a fungus-based protein, or a company for, called Corn from the UK that, that makes a fungus-based meat substitute, an algae-based sports drink, and of course, what, um, what breakfast conversation wouldn't be complete with a discussion of, of the edible insects that are the cover of the, um, of the special issue of the journal in the delegate package. And the reason that these are, are up here on the slide and considered alternative proteins is one, they're all good supplies of protein. Some debate there and some, as to how good they are, but, but they're solid supplies of protein and they offer significant sustainability benefits. So a colleague of Ricky Yadda's at the University of British Columbia um, told, who works on edible insects, told me the following. Crickets require 12 times less feed and 13 times less water than cattle. Pigs produce somewhere between 10 and 100 times more greenhouse gas emissions per edible kilogram, as does mealworm. Uh, according to Corn, the company that does the fungus-based proteins website, corn causes five times less greenhouse gas emissions than beef and 1.5 times less than chicken. So there's significant uh, sustainability benefits and arguably some significant health benefits to shifting to a diet that has these sort of products incorporated into them. But does that mean that, um, you know, in a couple years when we're watching Tom Brady win the yet another Super Bowl, we'll be saying no to beef jerky and hello to cheddar cheese larvettes, the original worm snack. Um, I, I think the answer to this question, despite the snickers in the audience, may actually be yes. I, I don't know. I don't know what the future is. But uh, here is a granola bar that I ate uh, last March at the Ronald Reagan International Airport. I was just departing from Washington, D.C., stopped at the kiosk, bought a snack for the plane, and I bought a peanut butter and jelly bar made with cricket flour. So this is, this is, this is coming. This is happening. And, um, and uh, for those of you who might doubt uh, this transition, and apologies to a couple folks in the audience who saw me present a few of these slides um, late last year from the University of Toronto. Um, I'd like to take you to a Saturday Night Live sketch in 1986, where Saturday Night Live sketch writers introduced me to a form of food I had never heard of before, but it aged 12 or 13 or whatever I was at the time, it was disgusting and hilarious. And it was McSushi, America's eating it raw. Because in 1986, the idea that raw fish could be a staple fast food item was the fodder for late night comedy. Well, within a bewildering period of time, uh, California McDonald's were selling McSushi. So tastes do change. And things that are considered by one, at one age as disgusting and weird actually get traction. Uh, and for those of you who doubt that this, traction, this transition may actually already be happening, here are two photographs uh, from the last 18 months. On the right-hand side is an undergraduate student of mine. She's just done a presentation on 
alternative proteins to a third year class and she's handing out cricket flower brownies to the class. And then the left hand side is a capture from our Member of Parliament's Twitter feed. Uh, the two young women there are also undergraduates, former undergraduate students of mine. They've just won the University of Guelph's annual chili contest with their cricket protein chili. And the Member of Parliament Lloyd Longfield writes, interesting, add cloves and cinnamon to insect protein, sustainable food supply available anywhere, bugs. So I think we're actually at a very interesting period of innovation in the food system. And although I started off with sort of doomy, gloomy type stuff, and then moved into a bit of data analysis which suggests that I can't imagine scenarios, difficult scenarios, but I can't imagine scenarios where, where we can feed the future, um, I concluded this talk with a reflection on the sort of innovative things and exciting creative things that are happening in the food system. Um, I would be a very bad director of an institute if I didn't use the last 20 or 30 seconds to plug the Errol Food Innovation Awards. This is a, a, an initiative that we're setting up at the University of Guelph. There are two $100,000 cash awards to recognize innovation in the food system. One award will be offered for contributions at a scientific and research level, and one award will be offered at, at the community level. So this is a plug. If a, the nomination portal is opened now, if any of you know people that would be worthy uh, of being considered for an Errol Food Innovation Award, uh, the, the um, website's down there. We've only got another week left in the, in the nomination process, but I thought I'd mention it anyways. So with that being said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simply wrap up here. That's, that's me. My name's Evan Fraser and, and my coordinates. I'd be happy to engage in conversations. Um, and, and I do think that the future can be uh, rosy in terms of food security. That's the final message I'll leave you with. Uh, we face significant challenges, um, but we also have significant opportunities here. And uh, with that, thank you very much.